50 INEC offices attacked in four years, report says, as INEC Chairman Mahmoud Yakubu insists that it is the responsibility of all Nigerians to protect INEC facilities. Tonight, in continuation of our town hall series and a countdown to the 2023 elections, we will be addressing the need for violence-free and credible elections in Nigeria. And of course, this is Plus Politics. I am Mary Anako. The Independent National Electoral Commission has so far recorded 50 attacks on its facilities across 15 states in the last four years. Imo had the highest number of attacks on INEC facilities with 11 incidents followed by Oshun with 7, Akwaibom 5, Enugu 5 and Eboin State had 4, Cross River State also had 4 and Abia 4. Anambra had 2, Taraba 2, Borunu 1, Ogun 1, Lagos 1, Bayelsa 1, Ondo 1 and Kaduna won. Now the breakdown has shown that in 2019, INEC recorded eight attacks, 22 in 2020, 12 in 2021, and eight in 2022. Now with the recent attack, the Chairman Independent National Electoral Commission, Mahmoud Yakubu, on Monday pleaded with Nigerians to see its facilities across the state as national assets. Yakubu pleaded, um, uh, well, this plea came following the seventh attack on INEC facilities in five states in the Federation in the last four months. Now, well, joining us to discuss this is Adenike Aloba. She's the program director, Data Fight. We're also being joined by Obo Efanga. He is the INEC resident electoral commissioner in Edo State. Ufoma Igbamuno is a journalist and he's the head of news with Cool Wazobia Info, while Achike Chude joining us is a public affairs analyst thank you so much lady and gentlemen for joining us it's a full house thank you for having us thank you all for joining us i'm going to start with you mr fanga because Idek is on the front burner tonight uh, with these attacks directly on INEC officials, Nigerians are worried. Many who are still waiting to get their PVCs are asking a lot of questions. Um, the issue of, um, you know, their PVCs being harvested, or data from their PVCs being harvested. And those who probably may, may, may have lost their PVCs in those fire attacks are wondering, will we be able uh, to be part of this election? But let's start with... Um, how INEC is going to recover from these attacks. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, uh, like uh, your background report has uh, said, it's sad that um, we're having attacks on INEC facilities across the country, and uh, you've given the reports of how many we've had um, in the few months. And going close to the election, uh, it's uh, worrisome that this is happening. But INEC is doing the much it can in terms of uh, recovery uh, of the materials that are needed for the election. Some of the materials that have been destroyed are such that we can easily uh, uh, procure or obtain ones, uh, including the permanent voters' cards. If there are some that have been destroyed, INEC is able to produce new ones uh, to give to the owners uh, to vote in the election. But importantly, we need to do everything to ensure that there is a stop uh, to this uh, uh, situation that is happening because um, nobody, this is not going to all go well for the entire country. It's not just um, INEC, it's INEC facilities that are being attacked, but the effects of it is on the entire country. And the election is very important in the, uh, to the country, and we need to have the elections in 2023 uh, because the tenures of office of um, various office holders will come to an end and you'll have to have elections for the successors in office to be elected. So it's something of concern to INEC and I'm sure that uh, every Nigerian is also concerned about this. But INEC is doing the much it can to ensure that um, um, even when this, uh, 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 this violence has happened, we are able to recover in terms of uh, uh, getting new materials for the conduct of the election. It's an expensive thing to do, but it's something that uh, we must do if the election is going to go on. Many have 
query the fact that if these things had happened in previous years, knowing that there is a tendency of it repeating itself, um, they're wondering why INEC had not necessarily thought of securing these offices where these very sensitive materials, especially PVCs that are very, you know, everybody wants their PVC right now. It's more like the most sorted after thing in Nigeria now. Um, many are wondering why these places are not as protected as Fort Knox or even the CBN. <laughs> well, the duty of securing a public as, uh, assets is not that of INEC, it's that of the security agencies. So uh, we are working with them, they know that INEC is um, a national asset, the facilities that must be protected. So the issue actually should be what have they done so far and what needs to be done uh, more. Uh, to ensure that um, this doesn't happen. It's not um, INEC on its part, um, we've done what we have to do. And when you talk about um, uh, the, the, the the permanent voters' cards, which is the, a, a much sought after item, there's no other way we can do than to have the permanent voters' cards in the INEC offices where the owners are coming to pick them up. Mm -hmm. There's no other place we can keep them. If we decide to keep them in very secure places, how will people collect them anyway? Because people are coming to collect them every day. And so they must be in INEC offices. And then the INEC offices need to be secured. And um, in, across the country, we are working with the uh, security agencies. And then um, after the more recent attacks, we've had more security uh, officials as uh, posted to the various INEC offices, both at the state level and at the local government uh, offices to secure the places uh, at all times. I'm going to come back to you, but let me come to uh, Achike. Uh, we're talking violence-free elections, so violence is on the table. We're seeing violence. We've seen violence before, during, and after elections. It's been a recurring factor in our elections in the country. But 2023 being a, an election that many have touted to be a game changer or make it or my, you know, election. Um, what should be done in terms of rhetorics to address this issue of violence? Because you see, at the core of this violence has to be something that is being said or done. And what do you think keeps, you know, fueling this fire? What would make it a Nigerian who's asking for change, who wants a change of, you know, leadership, who wants good governance, to go to a, an INEC office and destroy it? What would be at the core of that? Uh, these are people are asking questions of the Nigerian state. They are not only asking questions, they are testing the will of the Nigerian state. Mm. And uh, they have seen that um, and they have shown capacity to test the will of the state. And the state has not been able to sufficiently push back. The Nigerian state is weak today. It cannot defend itself, neither can it defend its citizens. Mm. Um, a state has a lot of power, you know, and, and, but unfortunately, you know, the fact that this is now happening at will is an indication that certain people are already aware that we can push the limits and that the state will not be able to push back sufficiently. So they are having a field day. They cause this mayhem and this destruction and nothing happens. They are not arrested. If they are arrested, the ringleaders, because there must be, they did not send themselves, they are acting at a script, nobody knows. Now you could say, at the initial stage, because we have had, we've been embroiled in violence for quite some time now, mm -hmm. over 12 years. Mm -hmm. Boko Haram, joined by bandits, unknown gunmen, and all kinds of non-state actors, causing you know, acts of destabilization in the country. Mm. Now. You, you, but at, at this stage right now, there's an uptick in the violence. And INEC offices continue or remain targets of these attacks. So you cannot say, yeah, if it's South East, it has to, you know, uh, do with secessionist agitation. You have it in other parts of the South Side that were hit at to not violent, mm -hmm. that we're not experiencing this. You've had it in the Southwest. You have it in parts of the North and all that. So that tells you that you know there is political motivation for some of the things that are going on what we are seeing is the disturbing rise of anti-democratic forces at work in the country mm. they do not want the country to work for whatever reason 
they want to influence the course of this election whether it is going to be held you know to 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 frighten people into believing that it is not safe for them to come out and exercise their democratic franchise or perhaps to scuttle the entirety of the electoral process itself you cannot help but have a little bit of pity for the INEC. And I agree with the resident electoral commissioner. It is not a security agency. They are dependent on the efficiency of the Nigerian security forces to be able to protect them, protect the elections, you know, protect their, their properties and their assets. And they are not able to do that. I remember about six weeks ago, we, we, we had a meeting, Nigeria Civil Society Situation Room, National Stakeholders Meeting in Abuja. The INEC chairman was present and the issue of his security came up. In fact, he was the first person. He was the person that said that there are two major issues that bother him. One is the issue of insecurity. The other one is the issue of the abuse of, of funds, hmm. you know, for the election by the politicians in terms of the electoral law, the stipulation of the electoral law and all of that. Security was a priority. He did say at that particular point in time that with the damages that INEC has suffered across other parts of the country, that they are, as at that time, in a position to remedy the situation. But that they are hoping that the security forces will be able to do their path to ensure that further damages do not occur. Because it will get to a level where they might not be able to redeem the, the situation. I'm curious because now yes. elections are not happening and it's going to be happening happening simultaneously across the country. If we're not even, there, I mean, we're not having elections yet and we're, we're, we're unable to be sure that these guys can protect our facilities and sensitive materials, how are we certain no, that no, they can give it to us yeah. on election day? No, no, they day? cannot. Listen, let's, let's not go. They, 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 look, this is not about semantics. Well, or what does that mean? Push. If you say they cannot, they what cannot, does that mean? They cannot protect. I want them to be able to protect because that is their duty. But they cannot protect. I mean, the, 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 the evidence is there. It's empirical. When they struck in Ogu State and Oshu State, the, 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 the fillers we got or the statement from the federal government was that they were going to deploy security to all INEC facilities across the nation to protect them, all, without exception. After that, we have had series of attacks on INEC facilities in Imo State, Anambra State, you mentioned, I think, Bomb and some other places, after that. So they know that they are, these are danger points. They know that these are targets. And that they, that they said they were going to be ready for, for any eventuality with, with regards to, 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 to those targets. And yet they happened. So what has gone wrong? Is it that they, they told lies that they were going to deploy you know, security to those places, they did not deploy security? Or that the security that were deployed were, you know, uh, that they were overwhelmed by superior firepower? We have not been told. How many security personnel there? Was there an engagement? There had to be an, an engagement. If you already had security people on ground and then you had no bad non-state actors coming in to cause problem, within those facilities that are being guarded by the security forces, you would expect an exchange, you know, of gunfire or whatever it is. But there will be a confrontation. We have not been told that in each of these places there were, I mean, such confrontations took place. Some or an attack was people, repelled. Uh, an attack was repelled and all that. So what exactly is going on? Mm. So sometimes you begin to wonder whether there is much more to what is going on. Is it being orchestrated at, by other, I mean, at other levels, at other quarters, by even state actors and non-state actors, or state actors acting in synergy with certain non-state actors? Mm -hmm. We do not know, but the state has a duty. The Nigerian state has a duty. The president has a duty to ensure the protection, you know, adequate protection is given to INEC facilities nationwide. It is a sad reminder of where we are in the country today. Mm. Former, let me come to you before I go to our data um, lady. What Tachiki has said, I mean, and the anticipation that has built up for 2023, a lot of people have so much hope out there, hence the number of people we see at, you know, INEC offices to get their PVCs. And if Achike, what Achike has said is anything to go by, that <laughs> the police cannot protect these facilities, how are we certain that we can be protected on election day? And what does this say about the enthusiasm, the hurricane of wanting to go out in 2023? <clears throat> Excuse me. So, so the honest truth um, for me is that 
elections will hold on February the 25th, and they will hold successfully in a large um, percentage of areas across the country. Um, this, what's happening now is not new. Um, at least I've been old enough to have followed elections, you know, from the late 80s, uh, when I was still a small, small child, you know, up until now. But I would say professionally over the last 15, um, 15 20 years, you see these things happen in the build-up to elections. We saw it happen in Anambra, you know, months before the election. And a lot of persons were saying, would elections be held today? Chukuma Soludo is the governor of Anambra State. Elections held, you know. The question would be how many people will turn up. But I can also say that with the, um, the persons I've interacted with, um, the persons, you know, in the course of doing our work across the country, a lot of Nigerians are getting ready for these elections. Yes, these issues are happening. And like, like Achike said, um, we can't take away politicians from being possibly responsible for these things. Um, one of my favorite lines from you know, Game of Thrones is that chaos is a ladder. Somebody somewhere is benefiting from the chaos. Mm. Somebody somewhere is benefiting from the insecurity we're seeing. Yeah. Is it possible or is it not possible that one political actor somewhere knows that this is my opponent's stronghold? So what's the best way? Because, let's not also forget, INEC, kudos to them. They, they've been able to reinvent themselves you know, in such a way that the average Nigerian is beginning to trust that next year's elections will be free and fair to a large extent. The politicians are beginning to realize that, oh, wait, the things we used to do before, you know, where we... Yeah. Elections are held in polling units, but they go to collation centers and rewrite results, or they take away ballot boxes and defranchise a lot of persons, that maybe it might not work. So there are possi is it possible that uh, it's some of these politicians who are instigating a lot of these... Uh, uh, My uh, question uh, is, what are they afraid of? <laughs> what are they afraid of? Well, I mean, you're saying it might be them. It's possible. So but what, what could they be possibly afraid so of? So the average Nigerian politician who has no other access yeah. to money gains a lot from being in office. That's why they move from PDP to APC, from APC to whatever party, just because they do not want to be out of government. For, do, for, the, for the politicians who have made um, politics a career, they can't stay out of government because of the amount of money they... See, I've seen a lot, I've interacted with a lot of them at close range. Once they go out of office, Six months, one year, the kind of things they used to do, the private jets they used to fly, the quote-unquote ladies they, they, are, they are used to taking out of the country, they can't afford those lifestyles anymore. That's why anything that will stop them from getting to that path, they will do it. If it means destroying INEC offices, so be it. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to come to you, um, Adenike. You are a data person, and, and I'm sure that um, you have also had um, conversations with INEC, um, you know, about these issues and the concerns that Nigerians have raised, especially the cases of fraud. Um, there have been also politicians who have said that, uh, you know, they're not certain if INEC's technology would really be able to take us to where we want to go in 2023. But let's address those genuine concerns like the beavers, um, concerns like, oh, can somebody use my card uh, if, they're, if they're asking for my data from my, uh, you know, PVC, can it be used on election day without me being there in person? Uh, have you had people raise such concerns? And, and of course, people have also said, how can we be certain that INEC is not also being bought over by these so-called politicians? Yeah, um, thank you very much. So, um, some of the innovation that INEC has brought into or that uh, has been introduced into elections in recent times and that INEC is going to deploy it for the 2023 elections are actually really good in terms of the, the possibility of reducing election fraud, of reducing election malpractice. Um, for instance, it is except there are other forces at play. Another person cannot use your uh, 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 PVC because 
because biometrics involve that's your face, that's your fingerprints, and things like that. So all these really cool. It means that a random person cannot steal your PVC and go and use it to vote. Now, here is where I think that, um, again, I, I have always been on the side of IMEC communicating more, communicating quicker, uh, and communicating louder. For instance, in all of the conversation around elections violence, the way it's reported in the news and some of the comments from my neck, there seems to be this attempt to address the public. You know, the public should be aware violence is not the answer. And I'm wondering why you're addressing a public that is terrified themselves. I think that the conversation to the public cannot be, you know, uh, don't engage in elections. Uh, because most people are terrified. Most people are afraid that their votes are not going to count. Most people are wondering, okay, this technology that we have introduced, outside of civil society and media attempting to provide clear understanding and explanation around uh, the technology and what it will mean for elections. I'm wondering how much more uh, uh, work I next need to put into communicating strength, communicating, uh, uh, communicating the fact that their own readiness I'm wondering when we're going to see INEC outreach. And I understand that these, these are, you know, for startups of government, you know, but I'm wondering where is the outrage against, or maybe not against, where is the outrage around the violence that is just overtaking INEC offices across the country? You can't fight with the people. You, you've got to fight with the people who are supposed to be responsible for keeping those items safe. I think that these kind of communications are important for the people to know that INEC is up to the task. Right now, it just feels like we're all, you know, INEC is trying to cut its losses. It's saying the things that, you know, we're working against it. But we're not seeing the signs of it. INEC is saying there's going to be technology, but people are still terrified that their votes are not going to count, that the human factor is going to come into play, you know, during elections where some maybe some electoral officer is bribed or he is, you know, and then they're manipulating the system. And, and it is nice for me to come and say, hey, that's going to be a little difficult. It's nice for me to come on air, but how much more nicer would it be if it is the INEC chairman saying this thing consistently to the people? How much more nicer would it be if we can see these conversations of we're going to increase security, we're going People are already terrified that votes are not going to count. Nigerians are already terrified with security issues even make it possible to vote. And now INEC, the custodian of everything that is supposed to facilitate these elections, appears to also be terrified about election violence. So where should the people turn to? Where should, you know, where should confidence come from? I think that INEC needs to do a better job. Uh, I don't want to say project false bravado. I'm saying that engage the conversation with the people in a way that they can understand. They can give, don't just say, well, uh, the federal government has said they are going to deploy forces. Yeah, the federal government has said a lot of things. They have said rice is going to be cheap. It's not. I mean, anybody who has seen uh, six months ago can tell you that. So they have said, oh, inflation will come down. Dollar will come down. It happens. So when you tell me, oh, their argument has said they are going to do this. It doesn't exactly encourage confidence. It doesn't exactly okay. you know, make people feel confident you know, in what the government is doing. And okay. so I think that there needs to be more clarity. This is how we're doing. And if there is a challenge, get the people on your side. This is the challenge we're facing. We have spoken to the police. We have spoken to these people. This is the response we're getting. I mean, Nigeria has a ratio of one policeman to 400 people. Already there's a challenge in so, that. So, so let's... But be more vocal about these conversations. I, I think I think that it's not a solution, but it's a step in the right direction. Okay. I just wanted to come in because, you see, um, when we started, uh, Mr. Boyfang clearly stated that INEC cannot be doing the job of security agencies. And they've stated that clearly. Yeah. But again, I, I'm, tossing it, I'm tossing the mic to you, Obo. They're saying that, or she's saying that you're not clear enough, you're not loud enough. So again, <laughs> how, what is it that you need to do for us to be able to hear you clearly and i also want to quickly toss this in on christmas day um the issue of insecurity is not just about INEC offices there are people who are also afraid uh, of what's happening in the area in kaduna state people were killed while those people were being buried another attack happened in those areas um 
how is INEC supposed to tell them that um, everything is going to be all right and we're going to have elections? How does that work? Okay, thank you. Maybe I should start by saying that um, on Christmas Day, INEC offices were open and people collected permanent voters' cards in INEC offices. During this holiday period, our offices have been open apart from uh, public holidays. And in some states, they actually open on public holidays to attend to members of the public. Uh, who went to collect their permanent voters' cards. This is to show that INEC is ready. People who need to access our, facil uh, our services are having the access even during holiday period. And we are sharing the information about what we are doing in this direction. So, yes, the attacks have been happening. Yes, we've talked about those whose responsibility it is to stem the attacks or respond when that happens. And I've also said that across the country that we've had more security forces in INEC offices than before. So like in the state where I preside as resident electoral commissioner, in the last uh, two months or thereabouts, we've had a lot of permanent uh, uh, security officials permanently based in our offices at the state office and at the local government offices at all times. So this is so members of the public who are in those locations see that there is security in these places. And that is why you find that even while this is happening, a lot more people are going to INEC offices to collect their cards. Today, I was in uh, one of the INEC offices, and I saw the uh, number of people who turned up there to collect their cards. So INEC is showing in its conduct that we are ready and we are working towards conducting the election in 2023. And the members of the public have shown confidence in it, and that's why they're coming to collect their cards. Mm -hmm. If they were so frightened about this whole thing, then you'd have a situation where people are not approaching INEC offices for fear of being attacked, or that they, they are not sure that elections would, would, would be held. Okay. Well, we're still talking about violence-free uh, elections come 2023 and all that needs to be done. We'll take a quick break. When we come back, can INEC, the media, civil society, bring a solution to the problem? And what would that solution be? Is it something we can get today, tomorrow, or maybe in 10 years? Stay with us. We'll be right back. It's still plus politics and we're discussing how we can achieve free, fair, credible elections and, of course, without violence, even though violence has been a major issue uh, in the election um, electoral process in Nigeria. And still in the studio with me, I have Adenike Aloba, Program Director, Data Fight, or Boefanga, INEC President, Electoral Commissioner for Edo State, Ufoma Igbamuno, a journalist with Cool Wazobia Info, and Achike Chudi, who is a public affairs analyst. Achike, I'm going to come to you now with the issue of what can be done? We've talked about all the problems, not even enough of, of, of the problems, but then we need to seek out solutions. Yes, we have, like I said, a tsunami. People are changing. Now, there's been this, you know, argument that the middle class is always found wanting when it comes to the elections. You know, a lot, of, a lot more of these people sit at home and tweet and don't show up for the election. Um, We've also complained about the statistics. We, we have so many people who register for the elections, but then very few of them show up to the elections. How do we change that you know, scenario? Uh, is, is there going to be a change for the better? Uh, with what we're seeing now, don't forget, we've talked about all the insecurity and all the problems that Nigeria is facing, including the fact that we have nothing close to good governance. Well, if you want to go by the classical or classical definition of a middle class, we don't have a middle class in Nigeria. Not anymore. That, that has disappeared, you know, eroded uh, over it, absolutely, completely. Except we are looking at uh, we are looking at it from the perspective of people who are fairly educated, like Miriam. You know, uh, yes, uh, that you can also look at it from that perspective and say, okay, that are doing well. Maybe one or two cars. You want to look at at it from that perspective because, okay, from that perspective, but. Um, I think things are beginning to change with regards to that because I think they have also realized the mistakes that they have been making, their, their reluctance to get involved in the political process. Under normal circumstances, it is not the very rich that drive people 
for political to ensure political change, you know, or social change. It is the middle class because they are the ones that are most affected, either positively or negatively, mm. when things go wrong. Mm. The rich or the very rich or the super rich are there and nothing really affects them so much. You know, so you find out that uh, in order to protect that class, uh, they, they, you know, they, they agitate. They are the ones that tend to influence people that are of the lower rung, you know, to get them to move towards a particular course of political action for the good of everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so um, if we look at it from that person, you realize that we are beginning to have a change of mindset. More and more people are engaging. You know, a lot of people, educated people, you know, people of the older generation. It's not just because people are saying, ah, it's the youth that are moving this, are mobilized. No, it's not. There are so many other Nigerians that are involved, that are in their, for, you know, uh, maybe between, you know, uh, 45, 50, 60s, that are talking about what is going on in the country and that want to be involved in the political process. And I suspect, uh, you know, that if the trend continues, you are going to see a lot more of them participate in the process. Uh, itself so it's not all uh, doom and gloom in terms of uh, their non-participation i think it really is a thing of the past people believe that this election in 2023 is going to be by voter and but what's what going to push that cursor in mm. the direction that we want it to go no it, I, I mean the 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 fact that people are tired generally tired of what is going on but in the country we, <laughs> you know, we were tired in 2015 they are more tired today than 2015. Mm. don't forget that in 2015 there was a breath of fresh air supposedly Nigerians months, felt, felt that a political party had been in power for how many years? Over 12 years. Okay. And that there are 16 years, they have not been able to do much. There was not much traction at the economic level, fighting corruption, you know, insecurity and the rest. And then you have now had a group of people who came and said, look, we understand the situation, we can solve this problem. We know what it is. And there was angst you know, with the failure of the, what Nigerians saw as the failure of the previous government from 1999 till 2015. And so that led to a, a movement in a particular direction that sought to the overthrow of that order, of that political party. And then this, this set came in. And so, you know, so for Nigerians, it's been, if you look at the experience before then, and the experience from 2015 to date, about, you know, nearly eight years now, it's like, they move from the frying pan right into the fire, <laughs> and, you know, and, and, and so and so and, and so Nigerians are now saying, okay, we gave these people a chance, we got the wrong end of the stick. We now gave the alternative a chance, we got the wrong end of the stick, and it is the reason why you now have, for the very first time, you know, for quite some time now in contemporary Nigerian political history, you now have a third party mm. that has made some sufficient waves you know, and occupied some space in the country, whether we like it or not. So it is an unprecedented situation that rather than the, the normal political parties, we have always, we have been used to the APC, the PDP, you now have another. So that gives a little bit of hope to people that perhaps we might be able to do something. Now you can see that the other parties are also worried, mm -hmm. you know, because down there they realize that they have also missed the mark somewhere. Mm -hmm. So it's not so, if, if you say yes, uh, yeah, Nigerians have, have found themselves in this situation, but the degrees have always been different. Mm -hmm. Where we find, I mean, you, the, in 2015 you talked about, <laughs> you, you can empirically, a bag of rice in 2015 was selling for how much? Today a bag of rice is selling for around 40, for something, 36,000. Uh, you know, um, a, a, a liter of fuel was selling for how much? How much is it selling uh, today? What, what is this uh, uh, foreign exchange? You know, uh, what is uh, the, the value of the Naira today? Uh, with regards to, to the dollar and other international, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, exchange instruments, monetary exchange instruments, and all that. So everything has gone downhill, and so you now have all of these things, you know, as part of the animus or the anger that is driving Nigerians today, mm. with regards to what is happening and the fact that they have to make a political choice. Okay, uh, I'm going to talk about the media here, which includes me. How well has the media done in changing the narrative? Because, of course, our job as the fourth estate is not just to get accountability from leadership, but also to point people in the right direction, um, whatever that direction might be. Now, there is that mentality that no matter how much you tell people about who they should vote for and what they should do, there's always what's in it for me, that mentality that we have as Nigerians. And if it runs across you know, all strata. How has the media done? How well have we done in 
changing that mindset? Do you think we've done well? Have we even scratched the surface? <clears throat> Without um, trying to, you know, um, pat myself or my colleagues in, in the back, I would say to a large extent, um, with the kind of confinement we found ourselves, you know, with, with some strict regulations, you know, uh, seen and unseen, you know, that we have um, had to deal with, at least, let me speak for the last seven and a half years or thereabout, um, you could argue that the, me the media has done well. Um, can we do better? Absolutely, yes, we can actually do better. Um, but let's also not forget that um, um, it, quite a number of media organizations also have their uh, bias. You know, yeah. there, there's the media ownership. Mm -hmm. uh, without mentioning names, uh, I think most Nigerians are even beginning to realize that maybe this media is tilted towards this way, that me media is, is tilted towards that way because of ownership or whatever um, um, reasons they give. But in all of the things we say, the average Nigerian understands one thing, that in seven and a half years, we've become poorer. Um, petrol, you know, has gone from 86, one something, <laughs> to 250, 270 naira. Um, for the middle class that doesn't really exist, you know, just a few years ago, you could fly a return ticket with 50,000. Yeah. If you don't have 150,000 now, I'm sorry, you can't yeah. make a trip. You know, all of these things, uh, as, as, if it has not touched you, it has touched me. It has touched, you know, the average man on the street. So they understand. A lot of people who probably didn't understand in 2015 understand now uh, the power of their vote. Understand now that if you sit at home and you are playing football on the streets on the Saturday when they are doing elections and say you did not vote, that you did not vote still means that you have voted hmm. because it means that a few, a, 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 a small percentage of people will end up deciding whoever will take charge of decisions for the next four years. Hmm. Um, if I speak for my for the media organization I, I work for, at least over the last uh, couple of years, consistently we've made it, um, um, you know, point of duty to educate. In fact, after every news bulletin on our station, you will hear, "Go and get your PVC. Election has elections um, have consequences. consequences." You know, so that people would know. And I will tell you to a large extent. That has also made a, a, a few persons decide that, you know what, I need to go and register. You know what, I need to go and collect my PVC. Yeah. Are we going to get it perfect next year? Probably not. But I think we're going to get it better than four years ago, better than seven and a half years ago. And we hope that, you know, with INEX uh, um, um, plan, with security agencies hopefully doing what they need to do, and then us, the media and civil society, will get it better. There's something Achike said, before I go back to Obo and um, Nike. Um, there's something that Achike said about, you know, the third force or the third party that has somewhat occupied space. Um, it seemed to be that this is almost something that happened in 2015 when there was that bandwagon, oh, this is the new baby, let's, you know, follow in that direction. Um, that bandwagonism, has it not been the death of us? So, to a large extent, um, you know, <laughs> see, the one thing I know for sure is that there's none of the traditional parties, the party in power and the main opposition party, who can beat their chest right now and say, come February 25th, we are going to win this election. None of the two. Including the new party. No, I'm, talk I'm talking about the two, the two traditional mm -hmm. parties. Mm -hmm. um, for the third force, the Labour Party, um, even they themselves can't even say for sure mm -hmm. that we are going to win this election. Yeah. And I love that. Because what used to happen, again, kudos to INEC. Uh, I, if, if, if there's one great thing that INEC has done, is to bring back some form of confidence you know, in elections. What used to happen before? is people will go to polling units, vote. You will see that candidate A won. By the time the results get to the coalition <laughs> centers, something else happens, you know, such that somebody that has 5,000 votes becomes 25,000. And you know, the politicians got so comfortable that they would tell you, eh, don't worry. In fact, there was a particular incident, you know, I won't mention the state, but 
the sitting governor had all but uh, reportedly and allegedly had all but lost the election and that's one person you you think can say how how did he do it but the plan from the opposition at the time was don't worry let's win it first let i declare it then they can go to court you know that that used to be the norm but at least from what we see that INEC did in Ekiti, in um, Oshun, and a little bit of um, Edo and um, Anambra, we can see for sure now that people's votes will count. You can't just buy PVCs and expect that you know you're going to manipulate the system. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be a situation where it's the total number of registered voters in each polling unit you know that will be used. It will now be a question of the number of accredited uh, um, voters. So that's why I'm, I'm just waiting to see what you know politicians will do on february 25th but the good news like i said is whether it is the apc or the pdp or the third force that is the lp nobody can s say for sure right now that i will win i will win okay uh back to you nike nike i just want to pick up from here vote buying um it's one thing that INEC has had to deal with is one thing that nigerians have had to deal with um um, how do we how do we change that mindset? I know, um, you know, talking about getting more and more people involved. I, I spoke with a young man who came up with an app, uh, a platform that is encouraging people to vote. He has 23 reasons why you should go out and vote. I think it's called Vote 23. And, you know, all you need to do is donate 100 naira so somebody can be called. So it's like a call prompt and it tells you why you should go out and vote. And that's one thing. But again, just as I asked to former how do we discourage vote buying? Because again, INEC is just, INEC has its job cut out for it. But then, of course, that's why we have civil, civil society and people like you. What, where do you come in here? Continue because um, civil society and the media have consistently tried, you know, especially when it comes to voter education. I think we have to continue to do voter education. I worry that a number of the political programs on TV kind of focus on politician rather than programmatic issues of elections, like, you know, core issues of education, of health. You know, sometimes a bunch of the conversation is between this party and that party and that conversation and that and the other one. I think we, we can't improve. You take the conversation in the direction of what matters. You consistent, and by you I mean us, uh, consistently speak about the things that matter, consistently encourage people. Because again, if all you see around you is co 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 co, you are unlikely to ask for banter when it's time to take a drink. And so, if everything, if all the conversations we're having, oh, this party, the intrigues of you know political parties and all the drama happening in political parties, and we're not having the conversations about the key issues of development then we're, even though we're telling people to vote, we're not telling them what to vote on. We're not telling them the things that should influence their decision. And I think this is the uh, next step that we need to do as civil society, as media, to say, focus on programmatic issues. We let the conversation focus around what do we want to see in education? What do we want to see in health? So when you're going to vote, this, don't... It's interesting how a lot of Nigerian politics... I mean, I know politics is a personality business we need but we need to find a way to make it about issues we and we have that responsibility because whether we like it or not media we're still shaping narratives we're yeah still but, but you tell me you tell so me about all of these issues better. and at the end of the day i'm saying i'm hungry what are you going to give me i've I heard all that. your beautiful so, ideas i've heard everything but, yes we want nigeria to change but i need money yes so honestly I, I, I understand. I don't know where I was having this conversation and saying Nigerians are traumatized by the problems that they face. So it's not enough to simply be, you don't sell your vote because of 2000 Naira. You've got to say it, but not in, that there's some, there's some part of our communication around these things that has been a little condescending, a little you guys don't know what you're doing, that's why you're doing it. You have to understand the trauma that people are coming from, the trauma of not being able to access healthcare, not being able to access school fees, not being able to eat, and help them to see that, look, I understand that 2000 IR by is now, but um, voting the right candidate in who is focusing on these issues and these issues can make sure that you're not hungry, can make sure that you don't need to collect 2000 IR. Look, it's not going to be easy, it's not going to be quick either which is why we need to do a lot and do it more consistently. I want to quickly, you know, address that. I think that INEC cannot 
focus on the fact that people are collecting their services because since 2003, voter turnout has been on a consistent decline. She were an all-time low of 34.75 million in 2019. And that is with increased PVC collection in 2019. So I think that yes, people may collect their PVCs, but that's not an indication that they will vote. And again, it ties in into the conversation of if we want people to vote differently, it's not just enough to say go out and vote. We've got to give them a reason to vote differently. Put something different in front of them. Have different conversations. Let's, let's really shape this narrative. Let's start this journey. Look, I must, I know that the change we're looking for and the turnaround we're looking for is not going to happen in the next four years. It's a beginning. Mm. Every election cycle presents a beginning. So it has to be consistent. It can't, and that's another thing, our conversations around important issues, around development, can't be around election cycles alone. Mm. It's a conversation that we have to keep up. I mean, addicts go to rehab, and sometimes they have to go and go and go and go again. So we can, I understand, we, we have to communicate from a position of empathy from a position of understanding that sometimes that 2,000 IR that we're thinking, they won't even buy my data. It's probably what's between someone and starvation. Mm -hmm. So if someone is facing starvation and you're trying to tell that person 2,000 IR is not the answer to your problem, how would you communicate it? If, if you know what anger feels like, if you know what deprivation feels like, how would you communicate it? And I think this kind of thought, this kind of deliberateness, in shaping narratives and focusing conversation not on what's happening between the political parties and which first happening and not they're interesting they give us the click but we need to focus conversation on this is where we need education to be this is where we need healthcare to be and don't just talk in you know esoteric terms where people cannot relate with it what does it mean for my five-year-old who can only attend public school? What does the next election mean for me as a petty trader who has just a small store in front of my in front of my in front of my house? Mm. It's in both sense that we have to communicate. GDP figures are all well and good when we're having those conversations here. Uh, a lot of people don't understand GDP. They don't understand some of the metrics that we you know talk about. And I, I can say that because I'm constantly facing with data and answering the question of how do we communicate this in a way people understand. It's critical. And so we can't just say go and vote. We also can't just say vote because, you know, we want education to be better. We want the budget for education to be able to think the same. It makes mm -hmm. no sense to my man. It makes mm -hmm. no sense to Bola. It makes no sense to Sidima. Who doesn't understand? He didn't even know that there was a declaration that says that, you know, there should be 15% dedicated to education in, in a country's budget. So what, how would I communicate to Bola in a way that she understands that Oh, this really concerns me. How do I communicate to pregnant women who have no access to maternal and child health care in primary health care centers? So let them know that the study you're about to make in two months is going to affect whether or not your next child is going to be born okay. in your house or whether or not you're going to have to take a three-hour uh, uh, cab ride to access health care, whether or not you're going to have to carry your own water to the PhD to give birth. Mm. So I think that communicating in terms of what people can understand, what people can identify with. And that's why it's critical that we work collaboratively. National collaborating with subnational. I, I'm speaking here, but somebody in Okene, for instance, may not be connected to this program right now. So how do I empower the radio station in Okene? How do I empower the radio station okay. in, okay. in, 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 in the Kodori Nogu State, for instance, okay. so that the same communication and lessons are going on? Yeah. All right. Um, finally, back to you, Obafana. I, I feel like <laughs> INEC has a big, 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 big job to do. And the last time I spoke with Mr. Okoye, I, I, I asked that question because you see, I understand that political parties also have a job when it comes to voter education, being that these are the people who are asking for votes, but we never really see that happen. And Achike mentioned something about, you know, political parties being responsible and party financing and all of these things. But we don't see political parties engaging in voter education. What we see is jamborees and campaigns and parties and musicians performing as opposed to telling people what to do. So even sometimes people don't even know what political party to vote for at the end of the day. How much voter education is out there aside from, you know, just having a voter education wing in INEC? Well, voter education uh, involves uh, various stakeholders. 
what your station is doing is also voter education. What the civil society groups do um, is also voter education. And of course, what INEC does. You've posed the question. I've actually asked uh, political parties when I have meetings with them, how many of them, how many political parties have a voter education department or a voter education uh, uh, person? And um, when I asked the question, they told me they had such a department or they had such a function. Which goes to the question, who stands to benefit from voters coming out to vote in an election? It is the political parties and their candidates. So we also need to see them do more. Like you say, it's not just about having uh, rallies where little is said about issues, it's just to be present in the faces of people that this political party is here. They've had this rally. So you see uh, uh, posters and billboards and members wearing uh, insignias, political parties. But people need to know what does one political party uh, offer that the other political party is not offering? Mm -hmm. What uh, is one candidate offering that the other one is not offering? On the part of INEC, when it comes to voter education, the voter education here would involve letting people know when the election is going to be held, what they need to do to participate in the election, that is register to vote, uh, collect their voters' cards, and know how to vote on election day, uh, uh, the time for the election, the time to come out to be accredited and to vote, and how they will be accredited. Mm -hmm. And also, we also tell people about how people become winners in an election. And I think this is one very important uh, uh, voter education component that I would also call on the media and civil society to focus on. A lot of people out there just think that the mere fact that they see this crowd of people at rallies of political parties, it means that that political party is popular enough and it would necessarily win the election. Mm. No, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. People need to know what qualifies someone to be elected president, for instance, or state governor or members of the parliament at any level. So people know that it's not just enough. You can actually have majority of votes cast in an election and not be declared winner because you've not had the spread of the votes. This is part of the voter education that INEC tries to put out. And I also think that the media would really help if they also focus on this because people are just talking about come out vote for uh, candidate A or candidate B. And uh, they are not telling people how that candidate could become president-elect or governor-elect mm. or um, member of the parliament at any level. And I guess that's why we're having this conversation and we can't stop having these kinds of conversations. But just to follow up on what you said, because we're out of time, my guys are telling us we have to go. Where's, it? Where's the NOA? I mean, we have a government agency oh, please. <laughs> please. that's put together to whose most their job is not just voter education, but educating the populace, orientation. And some, some of the things that um, the INEC Reg has said would also fall under the purview of the NOA. So, gentlemen, before we go, where's the NOA? I think, I don't know whether it's uh, the same. Uh, we, we had a similar organization that was uh, much more effective under the Babangida administration. Is this, that was a military is the same leadership. NOA? But you know, was it not uh, Mamsa? I think it was called Mamsa. Well, that was Mamsa at the time. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, but, but it's not MA. MA, MA is supposed yeah. to uh, exactly morph into the it, MA. I mean, it's not, it's a question everybody's asking everywhere. From Lagos to Kaduna to Abuja, people are asking, is there, "Where is the NOA? What are they? What are they doing? What they are they supposed to do?" They will tell you. Unfortunately, not yes. Enough. But, ah, yeah, but, 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 that's what they will tell you that there is no funding. And, but, but the issue that, that people go to work every day and, and they it, have a responsibility. No, no, can, can I say this? You know, because obviously people are not putting on their ticket uh, caps. They are not thinking. Because I mean, if you look at the the, the, the importance of the elections, for instance, INEC is being supported not just by the federal by the Nigerian yeah, government, yeah. internationally. Yes. There are so many activities that INEC has that is being supported by international donor agencies, agencies. because they know the importance of that. Mm -hmm. Same thing with civil society organization. NOA is a fundamental, you know, organization that is an organization that has a fundamental role in this election in an election you know a period so you you you, you believe that if the some people they were thinking that they would have looked for a way to access some of these funds that some other organizations within the country are assessing and, and it's there they, and should they wait till now and, and, again, and, and, and orientation there, has no, to be no, like no, you no, said, no, said no, 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 if they were the thinking there is yeah. a lot there's so a lot of yeah. agencies
collecting federal government uh, um, subventions yeah. yearly yeah. and practically doing nothing. Yeah. You know, so people are not thinking. You know, the, the usual excuse is, oh, there's little or no money from the federal government. But like Atuke said, um, you can as well get these some of these funding yeah. elsewhere. Yeah. But people are not thinking. That's yeah. just sad. Maybe I should take a placard can to the NOA. I just and, one thing very quickly that is it too late to ask INEC to collaborate with NOA? NOA is the 774 local government of this country. Is it too late to ask that there's some active collaboration, especially when it comes to voter education? Uh, with the NOA. I, I don't know because if I, I, I don't know if I need to ask them. We it's their job. Isn't it their job? <laughs> it's their job. I think they don't have to ask on. them. That collaboration okay. is actually on. I can, I can assure okay. you, it's actually on. Okay. And um, okay. in each of the, like you said, they are in all the government areas. They also liaise with the electoral officers. They're not, not, the not seeing it. In fact, yes, I saw something posted by one of the local government uh, persons for uh, NOA um, on Facebook. I drew her attention to some errors on it, and she had to correct them and put them on. So we actually collaborate. Uh, maybe I, I, I just have to mention this, that just like uh, the other person spoke, they may not have enough funding for all of this, but they are also trying in their ways. At the uh -huh. state level, I can actually confirm that they are doing uh, some work that collaborates with us in what we are doing. All right. Well, I want to say this has been a very interesting conversation. Thank you so much, Adenike Aloba, Pro uh, Program Director, Data Fight, Oboe Fanga, who is the INEC Resident Electoral Commissioner for Edo State, Ufoma Igbamono, uh, he's the head of news for Cool Wazobia Info, he's a broadcast journalist, and Achike Chude, who's a public affairs analyst. Thank you so much, lady and gentlemen, for being part of this conversation. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Not stop Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. Thank you so much. Yeah. And that's the show tonight on Plus Politics. We'll be back tomorrow. Don't forget, go get your PVCs, your passport to a new Nigeria. Have a good evening.